Lange tijd werd gedacht dat er niets leefde. In de pikdonkere, ijskoude wereld van de diepzee. De diepzee is het grootste ecosysteem van onze planeet. Maar we weten meer over de oppervlakte van de maan dan over wat er in de oceaan leeft. The solutions that these animals come up with to survive in this environment are so 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 different from this above water world. Hoe onderzoek je deze onbekende wereld? Die we pas net leren kennen, maar al in razend tempo verandert. It worries me that these things are happening at such a rate that it's really difficult for evolution to deal with these challenges. I was a Southern California beach kid. I grew up at the edge of the ocean. I was a, a good swimmer, and so my parents were, were not afraid to let me wander off by myself. Usually I had my little brother along with me, so I had to look out for him. And so I explored all along the margin of the sea, but I kept going out farther and farther and looking down into it and wondering what's down there. Who lives there? Bruce Robeson is een van de pioniers die al sinds de jaren 60 de grotendeels onontdekte wereld van de diepzee in kaart probeert te brengen en een groot deel van zijn leven onder de zeespiegel doorbrengt. I sort of knew who lived there. But when I got down there myself, I was amazed. I was astonished. I had no idea that that's what it actually was like. The closer I look, the deeper I look, the more mysterious it becomes. Robeson stond aan de wieg van het Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, hier aan de baai van Monterey. Een unieke plek. Onder het wateroppervlak duikt de oceaanbodem hier naar beneden en wordt een diepe kloof tot wel 4 kilometer, vergelijkbaar met de Grand Canyon. Het bijzondere onderwaterlandschap zorgt voor een ongekende biodiversiteit, vooral in de diepzee. Dat deel van de zee dat onder de 500 meter ligt. En voor de wetenschappers naast de deur. It gets deeper the further you go off shore. But the head of the canyon is right there at the, at the, end, of that, at the end of that jetty. It just goes out that way. In order to get the full ocean depth, you've got to go out maybe 30 kilometers. It makes doing deep sea research very available. Robeson is een van de eerste onderzoekers die in de jaren 70 zelf naar beneden gaat. I've spent a fair amount of time in submersibles, human occupied vehicles. And people often say, aren't you afraid? But it's so exciting and so much fun that there's no time to be afraid. It's, it's really compelling. Knowing that you're in a place where no one has ever been before and seeing things that no one has ever seen before. Bij Embari gebruiken ze alleen onbemande vaartuigen. Met camera's verkennen ze eerst de bovenste zeelagen. Die laten nog licht door. Maar hoe dieper je zakt, hoe donkerder het wordt. Onder de 500 meter leven heel andere soorten. En Bari heeft inmiddels 250 soorten ontdekt en er komen regelmatig nieuwe bij. Een van de bijzondere soorten die Bruce ontdekte is deze vis. De hemelkijker. 
The barrel eye is a, is a marvelous fish because they have a transparent covering over their head. It looks like the canopy of a jet fighter. Within that enclosure are a pair of tubular eyes with green spherical lenses sitting on top of two parallel tubes. The retinas are horizontal. Uh, and so the animal is clearly looking up. What always bothered me though was that they have this funny little poochy mouth that, that sticks out and is outside the field of view of the eyes. And I, I, I was always bothered by the fact that they can't see what they're eating. How do they feed if you can't see? So one day when we were out here diving, we came across one of these rare but uh, marvelous fishes. And as I was watching it, the eyes rotated downwards. I thought, that's it. The eyes can rotate. And then we were able to put together a reasonable scenario that these fish swim along underneath gelatinous predators, like big long siphonophores that have chains of curtains. So the fish looks up, sees the prey trapped in the tentacles, keeps its eyes locked on the food, pivots the body upwards, grabs the food, pivots back down and swims along looking for the next the next uh, food item in the buffet line. And that transparent covering over the eyes protects them from the stinging cells in the tentacles. And suddenly it all came together. That's what's going on. That's how this works. Those are the kinds of days in field science that you can't predict. But when they happen, it makes you really excited and happy. You think, yeah, I picked the right job. <laughs> this is fun. That noise is the socializing of sea lions who like to haul out on the docks and uh, displace people and boats and pretty nearly anything that gets in their way. Right now we're on the deck of the research vessel Rachel Carson. It's the mothership for this remotely operated vehicle named Ventana. And we use this vessel to take us out to waters over the Monterey Submarine Canyon where we dive the ROV down into the canyon to make observations, to collect specimens, to make measurements, and to try to figure out how it all fits together and how it works. It is a submersible, only there's no human inside. We humans stay up here and fly it from a control room here on the ship. And we call it flying because in most respects, that's just what it is. You're moving through a, a three-dimensional environment with the freedom to move in, in any direction at, uh, at once. From here down is the main vehicle. And then below is what we call a tool sled. On our tool sled is this suction sampler. It just, we extend this tube, hit the pump, uh, and hopefully we'll entrain an animal that'll take it back down the pipe into chambers in that portion back there. We also put static samplers, and with those, the pilot opens the jar and flies the vehicle so that it encloses the animal, and then we close the doors. It's a very gentle way of capturing the animals so that they, uh, they're not disturbed. So we try to be as considerate as we can of the animals they're trying to learn from. Uh, 
they're giving us something. So we try to be as polite as we can when we, when we work with them. And we have to keep in mind that uh, what we're seeing isn't necessarily an accurate representation of everything that lives here because we know that there are animals fleeing us as well as animals that are coming in because they're attracted to the lights. Olive has been diving with us for many, many years and she's still smiling. She's our mascot. This is without question, this vehicle, Ventana, is the most successful scientific ROV in the world by, by any measure because of the number of dives that it has made. In terms of science, nothing can touch it. Op een recente expeditie met de Ventana heeft Bruce een bijzonder dier gezien. En het is ook gelukt om het naar boven te halen. Het dier is voorzichtig overgebracht naar het zeelab van het instituut. Should we put some light on the situation? <laughs> Why not? There we go. Het is een zeldzame Japatella. Mm. Oh, it, it is pristine. Her is marked. I know it's in gorgeous shape. Ah. Have you noticed all the sparkly spots around its eyes and, and the arms? They're like iridescent freckles. Mm -hmm. Ooh, there, look. Those iridescent spots are novel to me. This is an octopus named Jaffatella. And unlike most octopuses that live on the bottom, Jaffatella and its relatives live up in the water column. They're free swimming all the time. This animal is showing us some really remarkable patterns of pigmentation and reflection from iridescent particles in the skin that, uh, that reflect back to us as gold colored. There's some on the eye, there's some on the arms, and there's some on the, on the top of the head. It, it is really neat to get an animal that we only see two or three times every year or two and be able to bring them back to the lab. And an animal that is able to, to uh, handle being the decompression of coming up. This animal was collected at 800 meters deep, and it seems to be doing fairly well as it comes to the surface. Some animals don't do so well. It's looking at us. Bruce is niet alleen geïnteresseerd in de unieke eigenschappen van deze Japatella. Ook in Monterey Bay is de zee aan het opwarmen. En de vraag is of de diepzeedieren zich daaraan kunnen aanpassen. Om daarachter te komen gaat Kim Reisenberger meten hoeveel zuurstof de Japatella verbruikt. So I add a little bit of antibiotic to the solution to minimize bacterial respiration. So what we see is that some species are finding that the depths that they prefer to occupy during the day in order to avoid the predators is no longer suitable for them because the oxygen has become too low. Uh, warm water holds less oxygen than cold water does, and the ocean's warming up. So overall, there's less oxygen. So animals are being pushed up out of their preferred depth range because the oxygen is being depleted. Some animals are capable of regulating their oxygen consumption. Other animals have limits. They can't uh, regulate low oxygen. 
Hoe de dieren hun zuurstof reguleren in een opwarmende zee... kunnen ze met speciale apparatuur onder water meten. Maar dus ook in het lab. I have to make sure I get every little bubble out of the container because any 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 air in the container will spike up the oxygen level. I'm going to be sealing this up and then we'll put it in this chamber here in a water bath and then we'll let the animals settle down in there and just breathe away. So we're seeing big shifts in the vertical distribution patterns of some species. And what that means is that established communities of species that have been living together for thousands of years are suddenly being fragmented. Some species have to leave the preferred depth range. We don't know where it's going at the moment. And the best we can do is learn as much about these animals as we can. And the more we learn, the better we can assess the problems and the better chance we have of coming up with solutions, or at least ways that we can deal with the issues that challenge us. And I remain optimistic because I know there's so much to learn. And uh, curiosity is, is something that, that doesn't go away. <laughs> I started my career using the tools of the 19th century. <laughs> and now, towards the end of my career, I'm using tools of the 21st century. And the kinds of things that I've seen evolve give me great confidence that there's a very good chance we'll come up with means to deal with those challenges. <laughs>